Right, good morning everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for what I'm sure is going to be a great few days. Um, and I'd like to thank my co-authors for collaborating on various aspects of this project. Uh, and also thanks to the Paleontological Association for the award of an undergraduate research bursary that allowed me to carry out this research. So we're going to the Miocene of Africa in this talk, um, and more specifically to the eastern shores of Lake Victoria in Kenya. And you might just be able to pick out a few little islands on the Kenyan shore there. One of them is Rasinga Island, and it's covered in Miocene sediments. And in red here, I'm highlighting the Hueji Formation, which has been dated to about 18 million years, and contains fossils of numerous mammals, reptiles, birds, um, soft, rare-bodied, sorry, rare, soft-bodied invertebrates, um, and the plants, which are the subject of my talk, namely the fruits and seeds. So why do we get fossil preservation in the Hueji Formation on Rasinga Island? Well, if you have a look at this rather nice satellite image, you can see Rasinga Island over here to the north of the Kenyan mainland, and you might just be able to make out the remnants of this volcanic crater. And during the Miocene, um, this volcanic crater, the Kisangiri volcano, was erupting highly alkaline eruptions of this chemistry known as nephenolite carbonatite. Um, and with the, the animals and plants living on Rasinga Island became entombed in the tophaceous and volcanoclastic sediments running down the flanks of this volcano during the Miocene. And Rasinga Island is also quite famous because it's been the centre of paleoanthropological research for over 80 years. And as this reconstruction quite nicely shows, we have a variety of taxa of early hominoids, early apes. So it also has the largest sample of the stem hominoid proconsul. And we have two species from Rasinga Island. We've got the smaller body proconsul hesseloni and the much larger proconsul nyanzi down here. So using the plant fossils from the Hueji Formation, we can test whether these kind of reconstructions are actually based on facts or whether a little more imagination went into their cre creation. So the floor is obviously vital for interpreting the environmental context for the evolution of these early hominoids. And we've actually got a rather large collection of fossil fruits and seeds now housed in the Natural History Museum in London and the Kenya National Museum in Nairobi. But only a few of these taxa have been described, and that was back in the 1950s by Kathleen Chesters. And we also have the problem that these are from surface pit collections, so they lack any sedimentology, stratigraphy, any of that context. So that prompted some in situ excavations for the first time to recover floral remains in the 1980s, um, and they were conducted in the grit member of the Hawaii Formation, shown here. And in 2009, the writing up of this excavation showed that we actually had 21 different families of fruits and seeds, so it's a rather rich flora. But that excavation also brought up some new seed morphotypes that hadn't previously been recorded from the flora, and they raised some rather key questions. Can we identify these species and they're the similar modern species? Can we place these fossils into a modern phylogenetic context? And can they contribute to those paleo environmental reconstructions that we were looking at earlier? And hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll be able to convince you that the answer to all of these questions is yes. So first off, are there similar extant species? So over here on the left, I'm giving you some line drawings of modern seeds belonging to the grape family in the genus Cissus. And if you compare these modern seeds to some of the fossils from the Hawaii Formation, you can notice that there's actually some striking similarities here. So this is suggesting to us that we've actually got um, some new records of the grape family from this flora that previously hadn't been found. And we think that these other fossils that have been described by Chesters from those surface pit collections had actually previously been misidentified to a completely different plant family, the moonseed family or the menisphermaceae. So to go a bit further with the identification, we need to look at some of the typical seed features that we find in modern scissor seeds. And we can see that they have this long feature that encircles the seed, known as a perishalaza, and it forms this rather thick ridge that you can also see in transverse section up here. And critically, we also have these rather deep and narrow ventral infolds on the ventral surface of the seeds. So if we then have a look at the fossils, we can see that, yes, they do in fact have this long perishalazal ridge, but actually, if we compare the ventral views of the fossils to this modern seed over here, we don't have those linear infolds on the ventral surface. So that might put a question mark on our identification to the grape family. <coughs> so to test this, we undertook some synchrotron imaging of some modern Cissus fruits, because we needed those high-resolution data sets to undertake an approach in virtual taphonomy, whereby we could digitally mimic fossilization processes. One of those processes being the digital infill of the seed coat, which might have occurred during fossilization. So here we have the digital infill of a modern scissors fruit, and we can quite clearly see that they have all those features that we've just noted. They've got these linear infolds and the perishalazal ridge running right round the seeds. 
But if the fossils were just infills of the sea coat, we'd expect to see these ridge, um, these infolds, sorry. Um, and why aren't they externally visible in our fossils? Could it be due to other taphonomic processes? So we then digitally infilled those infolds, perhaps mimicking another process later on in fossilization that concealed those infolds. And we can now see that there's rather a striking similarity to our real fossils. So we've got those perishalazal ridges running right around the specimens, but we can't see those ventral infolds. So we're, we've generated a hypothesis here that mineral infill in a later stage of fossilization has concealed these infolds and has led to the previous taxonomic error because these key features weren't visible when they were initially studied. So if we could somehow internally image these fossils, we might be able to test whether those infolds were filled by a distinct mineral. So to do that, we undertook some micro-CT imaging of the fossils shown in these two examples here. And in yellow, and this is a modern cis of seed um, from our synchrotron imaging, and in yellow I've highlighted the inner seed coat. And you can quite clearly see that for our fossils and for the modern, we have these rather deep, narrow, linear ventral infolds in our fossil specimens, but they have been infilled by mineral. So it suggests that our hypothesis is correct, that these are members of the Vitaceae in the genus Cissus, but that the infolds have just been obscured by infill during later stages of fossilization. So going a step further, we think we've got four new species of cystus here based on the unique morphological characters that you can see um, on these specimens from the Hueji formation. This first species, which is represented by only a single specimen, has these rather long radiating ridges um, coming from the ventral margin and also these near vertical ridges parallel to the sea margin. This second species, which is known from a number of specimens, has these short radiating ridges uh, and a reticulate margin around the seeds. The third species is a bit smaller, as you can see here, and it has a reticulum over the lateral faces and an absence of the marginal ridges, which you can see in the first two species. And the fourth has this uh, uniquely smooth seed coat with a rather thick median ridge. So can we place these fossils into a phylogenetic context? Can we suggest where they lie in the cissus phylogeny? So to do that, we looked at similar extant species and grouped them into four modern morphotypes. So you can see here that we have some external line drawings of the seed ornament and some internal images from our synchrotron imaging. And we were able to assign the fossils to each of these morphotypes. So in this first group, we have the species Cissus integrifolia and Cissus popolnea, and they're most similar to this fossil here. And as you can see, these have these long radiating ridges um, and near vertical ridges as well. So annoyingly, um, the, the species that were most similar to our fossils hadn't been included in any previous phylogenetic analyses. So in collaboration with some folks at Kew Gardens, we were able to incorporate those <coughs> species that were most similar to our fossils into a new cissus phylogeny. And now I appreciate you might not be able to see much of the detail going on here, so I'll break it down a little. Um, we have a large clade of neotropical cissus. We've got three clades containing Australasian and other African cissus, which have seed morphology that's different to our fossils. And then we have, that leaves us with four groups of species that are similar to our fossils. So we have the Cissus integrifolia clade with modern species that share this kind of seed morphology. We have the Cissus barbiana clade with modern species that share this morphology. We have the Cissus skiophila clade which have this reticulate morphology that we find in this species here. And the fourth species, the fourth clade, sorry, is Cissus pediolata and contains species with this uniquely smooth sea coat. So this shows us that by the early Miocene in Kenya, we probably had at least four clades and um, so it's phylogenetic diversity in the early Miocene of Kenya. So can we infer the biology and ecology of these fossils? Well, again, we looked at those similar modern species and looked at the habit and habitat data. And the modern species most similar to these two fossils were herbaceous to woody climbers in rainforest and closed woodland. And I'm showing you here an example of modern Cissus barbiana in a swamp forest in Central Africa. So we could probably infer that these two fossils were climbers in moist forest and closed woodlands. The, and the, the modern species most similar to these two fossils um, were climbers. And those with the uh, smooth morphology today actually have this rather succulent morphology to the stems. Um, this is a modern species, Cissus quadrangularis, um, from dry Madagascan woodland. Uh, and these modern species inhabit rainforests, but also into more open areas of woodland and savanna grassland. So here we can suggest that these two species are probably also climbers um, in forest and also more open areas of woodland and savanna. So can the fossils contribute to paleoenvironmental reconstructions? Well, I think given the information I've just showed you that they can, um, and they suggest that there's probably a habitat mosaic during the early Miocene, uh, with local patches of forest and closed woodland, 
surrounded by more open areas of woodland into savannah and bushland. So if you have a look at some other reconstructions that have been done for the early hominoids from the Hewedge Formation, there's probably elements of truth to all of them, really. So we have more closed scenarios, um, like this one down here, and also into more open areas of open savannah and bushland. So in conclusion, we think we've been able to securely identify four fossil seed morphotypes to Cissus in the grape family using external and internal micro-CT imaging. We've been able to explain previous taxonomic errors due to the concealment of key features during fossilization, as we've shown by virtual taphonomy and micro-CT. And this now constitutes the earliest record of the grape family in Africa. The fossil seeds have been assigned to four modern morphotypes, and they're distributed in four clades of early, and diver early diverging lineages. And the paleoecology that we've been able to infer suggests that there was this early Miocene mosaic of closed woodland surrounded by more open environments. And this is obviously providing some key environmental context for the early evolution of stem hominoids. Thank you very much.